Okay, welcome everybody. Um, we'll just give everybody a minute or two to join us online. Um, my name is Mandy Davidson. I'll be your host today. Um, and as I said, I can see people are joining. So we'll give everybody a minute or two um, just to log on and get themselves ready. Okay, so I might kick off. Um, hi everybody, thanks for joining us for today's session and for giving us your time so that we can provide you with some information about the Marinus Link converter stations and the environmental assessment process for Marinus Link. As I said, my name's Mandy Davidson and I have the pleasure of chairing today's session. I'm joined today by two key members of the Marinus Link team. We have Ben White, who is the Executive Manager of Stakeholder Relations, Land and Environment, and Kate Gard, who is the Head of Land, Environment and Planning. The first part of today's session will provide you with an overview of Marinus Link, the converter stations in Tasmania and the environmental assessment process. And the formal presentations will then be followed by a Q&A session where Ben and Kate will answer your questions. Before we start, I want to run through some housekeeping just to make sure that the session runs smoothly for everyone. Firstly, we ask that everyone keeps their microphones on mute for the duration of the session. We encourage you to raise any questions using the Q&A tool. As shown on the slide, you can access your microphone and the Q&A tool on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We'd encourage you to submit questions through the Q&A tool at any time during the session and we'll answer these after the presentations. We encourage you to like any questions that are posted to let us know what topics to focus on during the Q&A. We'll try our best to answer as many questions as we can and we'll record all of the outstanding questions to follow up after the webinar. We will be recording the session today and we'll make it available on our website afterwards. I'll now hand over to Ben White. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Mandy. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for your time and for joining us today on what is another important part of our project's progression. First, I'd like to acknowledge country and in the spirit of reconciliation on behalf of Marinus Link Proprietary Limited, we acknowledge First Nations peoples throughout Australia, in particular, uh, the First Nations peoples of the project area in which we're focusing. And it's their connections and your connections to land, to sea and sky and the community that we value and we respect. So to elders past, present and emerging, uh, we ex extend that respect and to anyone who is joining us today, um, we respect you and thank you for, for your time and attention. My task here is to give you a bit of an overall picture of who we are at Marinus Link Proprietary Limited. What is Marinus Link? and why is it needed and to set that context for you. So Marinus Link Proprietary Limited is a subsidiary company of TAS Networks and TAS Networks, a Tasmanian government owned business, is charged with the ownership, operation and maintenance of the transmission and distribution networks in Tasmania. So that's all the poles and wires uh, that distribute the generated energy to industries, businesses and households in Tasmania. We've been fortunate enough to have now a standalone business in Marinus Link Proprietary Limited to deliver what is the high voltage direct current component um, of this very exciting and nationally significant project. Marinus Link itself is 1,500 megawatts of high voltage direct current two-way electricity and telecommunications exchange between Tasmania and Victoria. It is part of the national electricity market. This is what some people refer to as one of the largest machines in the world. It is all the electricity and energy networks from Tasmania to Victoria, New South Wales to Queensland, even to South Australia. So it's an enor enormous interconnected system and Marinus Link is a fundamental and key part of that future network. 
will be traversing with cables under sea approximately 255 kilometres. And when we reach the shore at Waratah Bay in Victoria, just west of Wilson's Promontory, we'll be tracking our high voltage direct current cabling underground approximately 90 kilometres into the Latrobe Valley. And as you can see on the map here, back in Tasmania, we will also be augmenting the existing and building new transmission high voltage alternating current um, uh, to an, an extent through the northwest of Tasmania. Mariner's link at each end, being high voltage direct current, will be connected with converter stations. And these converter stations convert that direct current electricity back into the alternating current network at both ends, both in Victoria and Tasmania. And it's the alternating current um, form of electricity is what we get to enjoy when we flick a switch on in our homes uh, or in our businesses. I mentioned Mariner's Link will carry with it optic fibre. I'll talk uh, a little bit more about that in a moment. But we will build this project in two stages, so two 750 megawatt stages. And to put that into comparison, some of you may be aware of Bass Link, the existing high voltage direct current interconnector between Tasmania and Victoria. You can see uh, a thin green line on the map there running from Georgetown in northeast Tasmania uh, to the eastern shores of Gippsland. That tap carries a capacity of around 500 megawatts. Um, although Marinus Link uh, is quite markedly different in terms of its technology and being brought in at a very different time in the energy system, going from thermal generation to renewables, uh, it is Marinus Link three times the capacity of the existing interconnector. So all up, we will have around 2,000 megawatts or two gigawatts of interconnection between Tasmania and Victoria uh, by the end of the decade. Just to look at this a little bit differently, so you can see um, the different terrains that we cover. So that Northwest transmission development upgrade in Tasmania, where we will come uh, to a switching station and converter stations near Haybridge, which I'll explain a bit more in a moment, uh, just um, east of Burnie. Then we will traverse from those converter stations underground and under sea, running north across the Bass Strait into um, South Gippsland, Waratah Bay, continuing those electricity cables that are high voltage direct current underground and connecting them into the Latrobe Valley. We will connect back into converter stations and then into the existing network there in, uh, in the Latrobe Valley. Telecommunications is an interesting component of this project, although the mainstay is to deliver um, low cost, reliable, clean electricity. Um, all transmission carries with it optic fibre because essentially our electricity network communicates with itself. It's a very finely tuned and balanced system that needs um, those telecommunication and data exchange services. But what it does uh, at the size of the optic fibre that Marisink carries is open up a whole range of new possibilities uh, that go beyond the energy sector into the telecommunications and data exchange sectors. So we're really excited about this component. We're doing a bit more work on that. But what we may see is lower cost, uh, more choice, more reliability in terms of uh, internet, internet connection, mobile coverage, but also the chance to establish data centres to house uh, valuable data uh, that is definitely being uh, pursued worldwide as we digitise our economies. And that in itself will bring more jobs and more growth uh, into the future for Tasmania. Just to take a step back, why is this needed? Why is a project of this scale and nature required? This is information from the Australian Energy Market Operator. They are um, a body that is established and auspiced by all governments, both nationally and state governments in Australia, to 
um, run and plan for system, which is in a rapid transformation. What we're seeing, and some of you may already be quite aware of this, is the closure of thermal generation, mostly in the form of coal. And we're seeing that happening at a faster rate than has traditionally been forecast or planned. We're seeing coal-fired power stations closing uh, because of their age. They're nearing the end of their technical life. But now we're seeing more and more the economics um, of keeping these power stations going is reducing because the, the cost and abundance of wind and solar is dropping. And we're also seeing policies uh, coming in that are supporting cleaner and lower emissions technologies into the future. The figure on the left, 24,000 megawatts or 24 gigawatts um, of thermal generation being retired um, really in the next 10 years, 10 to 12 years, is a phenomenal amount of energy coming out of our existing system. This is the national electricity market figure. So this is energy that is running from Tasmania, Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland and South Australia. To put that into context, 24,000 megawatts is the equivalent of New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania's peak demand at any given time combined. So uh, it's an enormous amount of thermal capacity, mostly coal, coming out of our system over the next 10 to 12 years. That has to be replaced and is being replaced at a rapid scale. So we're seeing that will be supplemented with around 74,000 megawatts of new large-scale wind and solar. As I mentioned before, it's the lowest uh, cost form of energy and the locations of those new solar and wind farms, whether they're onshore or offshore wind uh, facilities, are in largely different places to where our coal fields um, have traditionally been established. So therefore we need to augment our transmission networks to gather and collect and send that new form of renewable energy to the customer bases in cities and in large industries and businesses. Now we know the wind uh, isn't always present and the sun isn't always shining. So that wind and solar energy needs to be topped up or firmed up by what we call dispatchable capacity. And that will come in the form of gas, of batteries, hydro, and also pumped hydro storage. And that's, I guess, the business case for Marinus Link. This is the nation switches over to wind and solar. It needs that firm, topped up capacity. Here in Tasmania, we have an abundance of hydro resources that has already been built uh, and is more than uh, servicing the needs of Tasmanian consumers. The key thing to, to note here is the world with Marinus Link will see a fundamental shift in how the hydro system in Tasmania is utilised. Traditionally, it's been a baseload supply for Tasmanian consumers. What we will see with Marinus is that hydro resource will be held back in storage and it will be replaced largely by new wind development in Tasmania. Marinus Link will enable Tasmanians to um, import and absorb excess solar next to zero cost solar from the mainland through the day. So we'll have a mix of wind topped up with solar. And if there's still a gap in terms of the demand profile for the supply, we will use some hydro to top that up. That will free up hydro then to be of an extraordinary value to set, be sent north to the mainland to help top up wind and solar activities there. So for, for Tasmania, we get a win-win. We get the lower cost uh, form, lowest cost form of energy, whilst having the ability to export a very, very high value uh, resource. And that will serve Tasmanians extremely well into the future and enable us to diversify our industries and our jobs um, as, we, as we transition our economy. 
all of this isn't just what we talk about. This is being recognised by the Australian Energy Market Operator, an independent body that is highly regarded and highly resourced to work out the most optimum way of designing and running our power system. In a recent report that they uh, have produced, the Integrated System Plan for 2022, they produce these every two years, they have classified Marinus Link as one of the most urgently required network upgrades in the country. So um, that gives us great confidence that the work we've done is robust and it has been verified by the independent energy market operator. We've also been fortunate to have been regarded by all energy ministers across the country as recent as last Friday as being a project of national significance. And it's for the reasons I described before, there's a sense of urgency in um, the need for access to firm dispatchable capacity that is deep and long duration in nature, being our hydro resource, but also um, the switch to renewables to reduce emissions, to keep lights on, to keep power prices low and to create jobs at the end of the day for generations to come. So we are being recognised at the highest levels, uh, both in government and in the industry uh, to progress at pace. All economic modelling that we've done as well as the Australian Energy Market Operator sees that benefits will flow to all customers across the national electricity market. Now, a project of this scale and nature is large in its cost. Our most recent cost estimate uh, sees both Maris Link together with that Northwest Transmission Development um, component in Tasmania of approximately $3.8 billion in last year's dollars and 2021 dollars. But we will deliver benefits to electricity consumers of around four and a half billion above and beyond the cost of the project. So to put that differently, we will generate benefits of close to $8 billion um, and then you subtract the cost of the project of around $4 billion. So you're getting that net market benefit that is significant and that benefit will be shared uh, in consumer pockets right across the country. And if you're in Victoria and we see some really ambitious um, targets being set around emissions reduction and renewable energy generation, and even more recently with the onset of offshore wind targets. Again, as I described, access to the resources and the flexibility and complementarity of resources in Tasmania with Victoria enables projects in Victoria to become more bankable, more firm and reliable, will get them off the ground and then through interconnection, we all share in the benefits of that lower cost, more reliable and clean energy. To give you a bit more of a sense of what does this look like uh, as we progress Marinus, well, the first stage 750 megawatt link, which will have built and in service in the year 28, 29, it starts to unlock that excess latent capacity that already exists in the hydro network of around 500 megawatts. Hydro Tasmania, the generating business in Tasmania, plans to redevelop the Terralia power station as well as some other station upgrades in the west of Tasmania. That in its own right will um, increase the output by around 300 megawatts. And the first stage of Marinus Link will also solicit around 900 megawatts of new wind development. So that's, that's what will fill up, if you like, the, the capacity of the first link. So that hydro capacity that already sits uh, existing in excess today, topped up with some um, efficiencies and further output from existing power plant, together with new wind, will fill up that. Uh, first link. The second link then brings on what's called pumped hydro energy storage. This is where uh, there's plans in Tasmania, but you may also be aware in New South Wales, 
with Snowy 2.0, the option to store energy in a form of water. It's essentially a giant water battery where uh, run this scenario in your mind. Through the day, if you're sitting here in Tasmania, Marinus Link's in place. We can be importing excess solar from the mainland that, as I mentioned, will be next to zero in price. We will use that solar in our homes and our businesses and whatever uh, is of uh, additional from that, we will use that energy to drive the turbines of pumping water from existing storages up into a new storage facility, a turkey's nest reservoir, holding that energy in the form of water, only then to be released instantaneously when it's needed to customers. And that's the business case and the motion uh, of, of the energy system in a world with Maris Link. So we'll get that pumped hydro energy storage potential up in the second 750 megawatt link, and then we will see even more wind come about uh, on that second link development. And as I said, that combination of more wind in Tassie will go to a local market, we will absorb and import cheap solar, we'll get that nice, reliable, clean, low cost profile for our needs in Tasmania topped up with a little bit of hydro as required. Otherwise, we free up largely a lot of that hydro and some of that additional wind capacity to be sent north uh, at uh, a very a very valuable uh, time in the market to top up projects across the rest of the national electricity market. People uh, rightly and often question, well, who's going to pay for all of this? How do you uh, recover the cost of a project like this? And will Tasmanians bear the, um, the bulk of the, the cost? Now, I just want to take a moment to explain that with you. So current pricing um, regulation in the energy market often sees what they call the two trading regions. And in this case with Marin's Link, Tasmania and Victoria, sharing the cost of the asset in a roughly 50-50 split. Now we know a, a project of a value of around $4 billion uh, shared 50-50 between Tasmania and Victoria is just not feasible. The consumer base in Tasmania is significantly lower than those in other states and particularly in Victoria. To give you a sense, there's around um, 280,000 uh, customers in Tasmania, 280,000. And in Victoria, we're, around, we're seeing around two and a half million customers, so nearly 10 times as many. But what we're seeing in our model is the energy market benefits don't just stop in Tasmania and Victoria, they flow right throughout that national electricity market. So what we're pursuing, and we're getting some great traction with governments and energy market bodies, is applying a cost recovery scheme that is commensurate with where the benefits, the energy market benefits reside. And that's the work we've been doing and getting good traction on and good buy-in. And we're also in parallel considering the potential for an energy market rule change that would enact uh, that allocation. So we get uh, a fairer, more equitable share of costs that are aligned and commensurate with the benefits um, that will be experienced. We talk about additional benefits. So we talk about energy benefits, benefits to consumers where the prices are lower, the energy is more reliable and cleaner. Well, as I mentioned before too, this is a significant infrastructure project that not only in its own right will generate jobs and economic investment, it will unlock a whole pipeline, a generational length pipeline of economic development and jobs. These are the figures just for the Marinus Link interconnector itself. So we're seeing in Victoria, a direct investment of around one and a half billion dollars and close to 1400 direct and indirect jobs. And the same figures roughly in Tasmania. So that's just the transmission component. This doesn't take into account the jobs uh, and investments of all of that wind and all of that upgraded hydro and the new development of pumped hydro in Tasmania, but also 
uh, in Victoria. So when you put all of that together, we're seeing this as a very jobs and investment rich horizon uh, that won't be something that comes and goes in a matter of a year or two. We'll see this investment and these jobs span, as I say, for uh, a generation. Sometimes we wonder why are we doing it all as well? Um, well we know we live on a very precious planet. Um, we want to leave uh, this beautiful place as best and if not better um, than when we've inherited it. And we've done some work here to understand a world with Marinus Link. What does it do in terms of emissions reductions? And we were staggered by the results. So Marinus Link will save, will essentially avoid 140 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent by 2050. And again, just to put that into perspective, imagining we took around a million petrol or diesel cars off the road, that's the sort of equivalent um, emission savings that will be achieved when Marinus Link is in place. Now, just before I wrap up, a couple of little details and we can take some questions um, at question time. But I just wanted to share with you some of the technical aspects of the project. Um, but before that, we'll go to a timeline. Sorry, I thought we were going to some uh, technical aspects. So the timeline here, just to summarise, as I mentioned, uh, we're building this project in two 750 megawatt stages. But before we start construction, we have to wrap up what we call our design and approval stage. So we're deep into that now. You can see the marker. We're at a point of a major decision gate, which is looking to go to tender for our converter stations and our cables. Um, and we'll have more to say on that in the coming weeks. Um, but the design and approvals phase is essentially all your technical elements brought together. You know where you're getting um, your materials from you know uh, that you've got your environment land use planning approvals uh, and you've got access and acquisitions of land. You've got all the finances um, and your ownership arrangements in place and you reach what is called a final investment decision. And we're planning to reach that final investment decision in uh, late 2024. And it's beyond that point, then we would start construction. So we're planning on that assumption of an FID uh, construction of the first stage link in 2025 and having it built and in service in around the financial year 28, 29. And the second stage starting to um, run into pre-construction and then construction in parallel and having it built and in service um, in the financial year 2030, 31. So this is an aerial view of our proposed converter stations at Haybridge, just east of Burnie. And this was the former Tyxide site that we purchased from the Burnie City Council. And we're looking to repurpose that now to house uh, our converter stations and our switching station. Now remember the converter stations um, converting that direct current cabled electricity back into the alternating current network in Tasmania, but also um, sending north the generated and stored um, alternating current electricity converted into direct current sent north under sea and underground and connected back into the Victorian network. So this is the aerial view of that. These are reasonably significant in their scale and size. The land area here is around six hectares. Um, each converter station, if you like, we colloquially uh, refer to as our Bunnings warehouse sheds. They're large and sophisticated um, shedding equipment that house this um, sophisticated um, tele um, and ele um, smart electronics that you can see on the, on the right hand side. The short crossing at Haybridge, we've not long um, finished marine geotechnical surveys and some near shore survey activities to better understand uh, the conditions on the seabed, but also 
um, there at the shore crossing. You can already see in that image, and some of you who are locals would know this better than any. It's um, a rocky reef foreshore. Um, what we're looking to do is bring our cables in as close as we can, and I'll describe this in a moment, using a water jet um, method. There's interestingly, for some of you who find this interesting, what is called paleo channel. So uh, old and ancient uh, riverbed carve outs in the landscape. We've identified these paleo channels run quite close uh, right to the, to the foreshore. We would look to bring the cables in as uh, far as practicable there and then look to use horizontal directional drilling. So using a drill rig system to bury uh, and thread through our cables under the, under the beach, under that uh, reef system, under the rail line, under the highway, and then to pop up into our converter station site. This is what things would look like as we lay the cables across the sea. Um, we'll have cable laying vessels that are uh, special purpose vehicles to, to lay sea cabling. Cables come off a drum system and uh, fall to the seabed where they connect and thread through a um, jetting and trenching system. And this illustration gives you a sense of what that machinery looks like. Essentially, it rolls along the seabed, it water jets uh, the sea floor. And you might remember as a kid, when you pour water over sand on the beach, it, um, it basically liquefies and enables you to separate um, that sandy, wet seabed. We will bury the cables around one and a half metres, and then that sand settles back over the top. And we've accounted for sea level um, temperatures, sea motion, and storm events in even in a future um, climate, and have found that the, uh, the depths that we'll be putting our cables are sufficient to see through some of those changes over the 40 to 50 year life that these assets will be in service. I'll hand now to Kate Gard to take you through our environment and land use planning impact assessment process and look forward to any questions at the end. So thanks very much. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, hopefully you can, everyone can hear me. Um, yes, so as Ben just mentioned, it's an extensive um, project. Um, and as you can see here, it um, crosses the three different jurisdictions, uh, the Commonwealth, um, because we've got Commonwealth waters uh, in, in centre of Bass Strait, uh, also Tasmania, because we have the converter stations um, around the Haybridge site, uh, which also extend out to three nautical miles in Tasmania. Uh, and Victoria, we also have the three nautical miles out to sea uh, and then the 90 odd kilometres um, up to our switching and converter stations up in um, around the Haybridge, I mean, sorry, the um, Hazelwood uh, area of town. Um, so yes, uh, we've got the three and so we're working uh, extensively with the three various jurisdictions um, to try and align um, and to coordinate the assessment processes. Uh, and as been mentioned um, earlier last year, um, the Federal Environment Department uh, determined um, the project to be one of 15 uh, projects that were a priority project. Uh, and what that's allowed us to do is to work the three jurisdictions to work together uh, to try and, and coordinate uh, the approvals uh, processes um, to make it much easier for uh, the community um, and other um, interested stakeholders uh, to see our applications um, and to yeah, make sense um, of the various pieces um, of complex uh, work um, that it is, um, yeah, to, to try and align them together. So submitting the uh, Commonwealth um, Environmental um, Referral under the Environment Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act uh, was the first, um, if we just go back to the previous slide and I'll just quickly do a summary. Um, yeah, uh, that was the first um, part that we um, put in. Um, 
in Victoria um, late last year. We also submitted the environmental effects um, application under the Environmental Effects Act. Um, and only um, last month, we submitted our applications to the Tasmanian um, jurisdiction. Um, so at this stage where, and we'll get to the, and in a moment about the actual timing, uh, but at the moment we have submitted our applications to all um, of the various jurisdictions and we've got decisions made on the assessment pathways uh, that are required. And that's what I'll talk through a bit more today. So if you can just move on, thanks. Uh, yes, yeah, so the Commonwealth decided in September um, last year um, that, the com uh, that the proposal will be required to be assessed through um, the federal environment legislation um, and determined that the application was controlled action. Uh, and that means effectively in our position, a situation here that an environmental impact um, statement uh, will be required. Um, and it has its processes um, about us um, preparing the EIS, the ex ex exhibition of the EIS, um, asking for public comment and then a decision being made. And if we just move forward. Um, the Tasmanian one, um, what that means is that the, the development application was submitted to the Burnie City Council. The Burnie City Council um, has sent a notice out to us for further information. That is currently um, stop the clock uh, and we are working on providing them with additional information. The converter station um, DA was also referred to the Tasmanian Environmental Protection Agency um, and the EPA uh, determined that it would like to assess um, the converter station as well under um, Tasmanian environmental um, legislation under MCAR. Um, the EPA also decided that it would like to uh, call in or at least assess under Tasmanian environmental legislation, the subsea cable and components. The way the environmental uh, legislation is set up in Tasmania is that we haven't been able to align those necessarily into the one. Um, however, uh, so two sets of guidance will be um, provided for us to, um, to address uh, those two separate applications. Um, as there's the decisions being made and similar to the um, Commonwealth, uh, we'll be preparing the EIS, the exhibition, exhibition of the EIS, uh, public comment and decisions will be made by the EPA board um, and the Burnie City Council. And the next one. So the Victorian, um, as I mentioned, the referral was submitted September. Um, the decision has been made that an environmental effects statement is required. Um, a, a, a Different to um, Tasmania, uh, in Victoria, a technical reference group is established um, who work through uh, with us and draft scoping requirements um, and then development of the EES, the Environmental Effects Statement. Similar um, to the other processes, it'll be exhibited and available for public comment. Um, and then that document will be used to inform decisions for other uh, regulators um, as to uh, the conditions of, of approval and, and the decisions are made. So if you move to the last, oh, okay. <laughs> so these are some of the uh, the impacts um, that we're um, across the entire uh, project, but uh, most are also obviously relevant um, to Tasmania um, and to um, the waters, Bass Strait, uh, air quality, um, ag, and I won't run through them all, but certainly cultural heritage, um, EMF, electromagnetic magnetic fields, uh, noise, um, and impacts on um, marine ecology and, and resource as well um, have and traffic and transport have been identified of some of the major or impacts that we will be looked to uh, be mitigating or avoiding um, and if the situation is to, to manage them if um, they do remi remain after uh, we've tried to avoid them. So this is a high level um, summary of how they all line. As I mentioned before, um, the various different regulators are attempting to um, align uh, the guidance um, and also the, um, the advertising of the um, applications um, so that uh, everybody can have a more coordinated um, view of it. As I mentioned, the decisions up the top have all been made and the time frame. so that's where we're sitting now. Um, that group um, of the various regulators have decided uh, that we're going to pr produce the one EIS, Environmental Impact Statement, which will address all requirements. Um, and that's going to be uh, complex in itself, but we're certainly working towards um, having the one document to address all the requirements. This is where we're up to at the moment. DOOR being the Federal Environment Department and DELP being the Victorian um, regulators, um, they're um, having to advertise individual sets of guidance. The EPA in Tasmania here will be advertising their two sets of guidance, one for the converter station and one for the subsea cables. And the public um, are invited to comment on all of those draft guidelines. They, at this stage, um, later this month um, and leading into September, um, those guidance, um, those guidelines will be available for comment and we'll talk about that um, a bit, bit later. 
those um, guidelines will be issued um, to us finally, uh, then we will go off and prepare the um, EIS, um, addressing all the requirements um, and also about the, the impacts and the ways that we're going to mitigate and manage those. Uh, and we'll also submit to the Bernie City Council to um, for in, in, enable them uh, to complete the development application. Um, then they, um, they will go back out for public comment and for review um, once they have been finalised. Uh, we will address all that information and then finally um, submit the final EIS um, to the regulators um, for them um, at this stage uh, later next year, at the end of next year, uh, in order for them to make decisions um, on the project. And at this stage, we're anticipating that all those decisions are going to be made mid to sort of early, late um, 2024. So that's pretty much, as I said, it's a very large and complex and we're trying to um, reduce it um, as much as possible um, to at least reduce the and to streamline um, so that everybody can um, clearly see what you can make comment on and how their project all um, aligns. So that's all I have, thank you. Thanks very much, Kate. Um, and thank you, Ben, for your presentations. Now, they must have been so comprehensive that nobody has any questions. Um, I've put a reminder in the chat that you can ask questions using the Q&A tool. So I'll just give it a moment in case we have some people who are furiously typing. Excellent, we have one here. Um, where will we, we be able to make comments against the guidelines? Kate, that's probably one for you. Thank you. Yes, so uh, great question. At this stage, um, the Victorian and the Commonwealth guidance uh, will be available, being advertised on the 24th um, of um, September. Uh, they will be open um, for three weeks, sorry, uh, 24th of this month, sorry, August, uh, and they'll be open for three weeks. Uh, the EPA guidance in Tassie will be um, advertised on the 29th of August in two weeks. We will put links onto our website at Marinus Link where it'll directly straight to that um, those pieces um, of, of documentation for review. Um, but they will also be available on the federal um, Victorian and Tasmanian um, uh, environmental regulator um, sites as well. But probably the easiest way at this stage is to come to us, uh, our website, and those will have links directly to those documents. Thanks very much, Kate. Um, we have a follow-up question. Uh, is there a plan available showing where the underground cable is proposed to run through Victoria? Um, ben, that might be one for you. Yes, there is. So we've got available our proposed route, which um, we disclosed in a route options report um, over uh, 18 months ago. We've been engaging with landowners in the community along that route since that time and have made some adjustments to that. Um, the, the final kind of version, if you like, of that route and what's um, made up of that, all the different components of the project will be part of um, the environment effects statement um, work that's to come. So uh, I'd encourage those to get on our website, have a look at our route um, and then when the um, Victorian component of the impact assessment process gets underway, more information will be provided then. Great, thanks very much, Ben. Now, this is a quite technical question, um, but Ben, I'm going to get you to give it a go. And I, I do preface this by saying that if the team here are unable to answer your questions today, we will um, follow up and make sure we can get some answers to you. How quickly can energy be turned in direction from one state to another? That sounds like a jeopardy question. <laughs> well, you'll be surprised I've got the answer to that. So this is instantaneous. Um, with Marinus Link, and that's, you might have picked up, I mentioned, there is a difference between what's the capability of the existing Bass Link interconnector. It has, it was designed and built at a time where we had predominantly uh, coal and gas, um, and the, the market and the demand was less. It has a, a turnaround time delay, so it can send energy uh, in one direction at one time, and has a turnaround delay of up to five minutes. With Marinus Link, we can send electric, electric, electricity instantly uh, in one direction or multiple directions and can switch that at, um, at an 
instantaneous speed. So that's one of the real strengths of Marinus Link is it's ready and fit for purpose for a very dynamic um, future energy system. We will have variability in terms of output from wind farms and variability in terms of output from solar. So uh, the converter stations at each end also play a significant role in stabilising um, some of those imbalances. Our converter stations themselves act a little bit like a micro um, generating facility. So if there is a system fault or there's an outage, those converter stations can fire up and reboot the system uh, like you might hear or see of um, utility scale batteries doing similar things. So that instantaneous um, ability to send energy in multiple directions, but also instantaneous reboot of a system really starts uh, to, to add value to a future uh, energy market. And that's why the strength of Maris Link's business case continues to grow. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, well done on that one. That was a tricky one. How will you be managing uh, noise from the converter stations, Ben? That's probably one for you as a starting point. Yeah, sure. I'll start and, and Kate um, can add to this. So through um, our design work, which I mentioned earlier too, that design approvals phase, this is so important to identify not only what is needed to kind of connect and make sure a power system is safe and efficient and reliable, we also then need to look at all the other values and constraints. And that's been um, a large and significant part of the last four and a half years of our work is designing this um, that is ready for that future system, but also ready uh, to sit in a landscape and in the community for the next 40 to 50 years. Now we know um, big assets like this can make noise and they can have impact. And as Kate described, we seek to find wherever feasible and practicable uh, the best ways to mitigate, avoid or minimise those impacts. Um, we're conducting some sound testing, uh, noise, noise monitoring at the converter station sites. Um, and if there are potential for noise impacts, we would look where we see feasible to make adjustments to that technical design of the asset to mitigate. Um, or we will look at other methods to enable um, that mitigation or minimisation of, of noise impact. And that might be um, uh, working with other landowners in the area um, around uh, avoiding that or minimising that. Thanks, Ben. A follow up on it, the converter stations, has the location of the Victorian converter stations been finalised? We've, um, we've purchased land adjacent to the existing terminal station at Hazelwood, um, which is a, an area that is already highly modified and housing much of the existing high voltage alternating current assets in the Latrobe Valley. We're also exploring, and you will see in our impact assessment documentation, an alternative site, which is southwest of Driffield. So that will reduce um, the project cable length by approximately 12 kilometres, which is good from a few perspectives. It's good for reducing the cost of the project. It's good in terms of avoiding um, impact on areas that are reasonably sensitive, like the Morwell River, and, um, and then obviously avoiding any unnecessary impact um, or disturbance for some landowners. So we're looking at that alternate site southwest of Driftfield, where we would uh, place converter stations and switching gear and connect into uh, the existing 500 kV network at that point. But for projects like this, you need to keep options open. Things can change, um, preferences can change, and um, having that flexibility and adaptability in our design work is really important. Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to achieve is the lowest cost solution to consumers that avoids, minimises uh, and um, mitigates impacts on the environment, on cultural heritage, on landowners and the community.
So we will reserve that decision closer to the time, but we're um, essentially looking at two options, Hazelwood and an area southwest of Driftfield. Thanks, Ben. Um, ben, sorry to keep you talking, but I think this sure. one's for you as well. Um, is Marinus Link engaging with state and federal governments and educational providers to ensure that appropriately skilled individuals are available when and where they're required? Yeah, great question. We are, in short. We are highly engaged with governments at all levels, including local government. Um, we're um, busy talking to a number of agencies in Victoria. We've got the Latrobe Valley Authority uh, and uh, Skills Victoria, similarly in Tasmania with uh, Skills Tasmania and a workforce uh, or a working group, pardon me, that is set up to look at the skills, training, workforce needs of uh, a lot of these future projects. We know in Tassie there's a lot going on, it's the same as in Gippsland. Many and varied projects of various scales. We need a level of coordination uh, in that workforce planning. Uh, we need to build up the skills and the training and the reskilling. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, as coal-fired power stations retire, there's many skilled and capable um, people from those workforces that can be transitioned, and we want to support that. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So there's a number of forums, a number of processes uh, that are um, establishing and underway. So we're connected to those, we're a member of those. And we know there's going to be a great deal of opportunity for um, local businesses and local employment uh, participants, uh, traditional owners and Indigenous participation too as part of that. And we're really excited to, uh, to be committed to that and also to work towards that. Thanks, Ben. Um, a question with regard to the cable crossing of Bass Strait, what are the activities and systems in place in relation to navigational safety? Yeah, great question too. So um, a lot of that early design work we had to engage with various authorities and also um, understand what sits already either on the seabed or what other uses of high value exist uh, in the Bass Strait. So there's so a lot of areas uh, for fishing and scallop uh, farms uh, through the Bass Strait. We've also got um, uh, gas exploration, gas pipelines, Telstra cables. We've got unexploded ordnance from former um, National Defence training days. So there's a lot going on there. There's shipping, there's anchorage, uh, and then there's the environmental values too, as you get closer into the near shore around sea grasses, seabeds that uh, have sort of high value ecological um, ecosystems. So we need, we need to kind of navigate and put all those things in balance. And, and the route we have found uh, largely avoids all of that. And that's um, route development isn't a straightforward exercise. That's why it's taken us uh, this long to come to the, um, the preferred route that we have and we're engaging on. You need to navigate these things really carefully. You need to look at options. You need to look at trade-offs. And I'd encourage anyone who's interested in how we've landed at the route we have to get on our website, have a look at our route options report, and you'll see if it's of interest to just the sheer variety of possible routes that we did consider um, in some detail and look at the justifications and rationales for why we've landed where we are. So I hope that somewhat answers the question. Thanks, Ben. Um, Kate, this one will be for you. Um, you, you touched on or, or gave an overview of the environmental assessment um, process. When do you think the team will have a better understanding of what some of the potential environmental impacts are? Um, oh, yeah, great question. Well, we've certainly over the last couple of years done many desktop assessments. So we have got sort of a general understanding as to what uh, the major aspects, we call it, uh, or impacts, uh, potential impacts may be. Uh, we're, um, as I said, currently in the process of getting the final guidance um, from the regulators, uh, which will allow us to do more drilling down into the actual requirements of the surveys. We are 
presently surveying and we have been undertaking surveys for um, a year or so now. Um, once that so survey data has been um, combined and gathered, uh, we're producing a report. So I would suggest um, in the development of the EIS um, early next year, um, we'll certainly, as I said, we've got a very generally a very good understanding as to what we're looking at. Um, but as far as the mitigation and the different measures that we can adopt um, to um, you know, minimise significantly any of our impacts, uh, sort of later towards later towards the end of this year uh, and early next year in the um, the, the formalisation of the EES. So that's um, in the EIS. Yeah, it's yep, a time great. Frame. Thanks, Kate. And another time frame question. This one probably for you, Ben. Um, when um, uh, are you, when are you likely to um, release tenders for the project? Yeah. So this is, as I mentioned, a really significant. Um, part of the project it really starts to signify this um, all coming into reality. So we internally through our board have um, approved a decision gate to go to tender. Our owners are considering that now, the owners um, of this project being the state of Tasmania. Um, assuming they agree and approve going to tender, that will be towards the end of the year. So we will go out uh, with a package for converter stations. There are only a very select few participants uh, worldwide that we've um, also pre-qualified. So they go through a pretty rigorous pre-qualification process to make sure um, they're fit and able and bona fide providers and suppliers that meet all the different um, international trade and sovereign risk uh, parameters as well. So that'll be a package for converters, and then we'll go out separately with a package for the cables. Uh, and there's only, again, a, another handful of suppliers for that. So by the end of the year, all going well, um, we will have those tenders out. One thing if uh, the, the uh, questioners or, the, or others want to know, if there's interest to participate in any way with your business on our project, we have a portal through um, the Industry Capability Network or ICN, which is a pretty well-known uh, platform for registering your business interest. We've got an outline there of the kinds of uh, package of works that we're looking for, the large scale through to the small scale. So I'd encourage anyone to spread the word, register on the ICN, on the Marinus Link portal, and, uh, and we can engage with you further on that. Fantastic. And I think this will be our last um, question for this afternoon. Has there been any advancement, Ben, on who will fund the project? I know you touched on this earlier in your presentation. And given um, the need for connection that's been identified, can it be fast tracked for an earlier delivery? Getting up to a point of a final investment decision, it's no easy feat and we're really fortunate to have had the financial backing of the Australian government and the Tasmanian government. So we are fully funded to get to that critical point of uh, ready to um, get shovels in the ground. So that's, that's a significant market. Now, people um, ask the question, who's gonna fund this project? Our challenge isn't about raising the capital to get the project built. Um, that's not really the problem per se. The problem is then how do you recover on that investment made? And the um, service by which we're looking to pursue Marinus Link is a regulated service. So we would seek um, a determination from the Australian Energy Regulator for a regulated return. So it's a revenue stream that comes from customers. So what we're looking for is a broader solution, a fairer cost allocation across the customer base, um, not only just in Tasmania and Victoria, but perhaps beyond. And we've got a lot of interest um, with the Australian government, the Commonwealth. They've already um, backed this project significantly to date. They have two members that sit on our newly appointed Marinus Link Proprietary Limited Board. Um, and we're also in discussions and supporting the state of Tasmania in its discussions with the new Federal Energy Minister around rewiring the nation, which is a new fund that the 
uh, new federal government has committed to, a $20 billion fund to upgrade our power system to make it uh, fit for purpose for the future, a lower cost, more reliable and cleaner energy future. So we're in ready and um, uh, live discussions on that. And I guess, like I mentioned too, being declared a project of national significance as recent as last Friday gives great impetus uh, and a really good sponsorship that this project will happen, it will get funded, it's the solution by which we recover the costs of that is what we're working through and we're confident we will find a solution where um, everyone gets the benefit, they don't feel the pain of that cost, but noting that this is a project with a service life of around 50 years. So it's, uh, it's, it's a great asset that will uh, deliver great returns, not just to consumers, but to investors. And that's uh, something, yeah, we're, we're really passionate about. Fantastic. We have had um, one more question drop in, which is about um, the, the link to the ICN site. So Meredith, thanks for that question. We'll follow up um, and provide you with a link um, outside of the webinar. So um, with there been no more questions, I think that's um, what we have time for today. So I'd like to thank everybody um, who is online today for um, attending. Um, we will be sharing some information about the Marinus Link website and um, where to go to find information uh, about those um, assessment processes and how uh, you can have your say on the guidelines that will um, will guide those. Um, and I'd encourage you also uh, to visit the site just for regular updates um, to stay in touch with what's happening with the project. Um, when we finish up a little survey will pop up, we'd encourage you to please fill that, that out. That helps us um, to improve and to understand you know, how to keep you informed. It will also give you an opportunity to sign up for updates about the project if you wish. So once again, thank you very much for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mandy.